so I'm here with my good friend Nick Mangillo. We were in CAG 1 together when I was CAG Ops aboard GW. Nick was in VFA 82. What was the, the squadron? Marauders. The Marauders. The Marauders. Been decommissioned since then. They're, oh, really? Yes, unfortunately, That's a yes. They're a cool squadron. So, uh, just like we were talking last night about what we did with Jello on that cruise, Mongo was on that cruise too. But let's go earlier in Mongo's career. So you were a Nugget in VFA 81. It's Desert Storm, and you wound up having a MIG kill. So tell us about that. I was assigned a strike on day one of the war. Now, please recall, the war started at night. So the first events were night one. And night one was a massive suppression of enemy air defenses to roll back their SAM sites and radars. And on that was my squadron, my squadron mates. My skipper led it for all the naval aviation assets throughout the theater. Hundreds of airplanes carrying high-speed anti-radiation missiles. And on that was Scott Spiker, one of our beloved department heads. And we watched these individuals man up to go launch at about 11 p.m and going to harm's way. And I remember that time, because I was flying the next day, I was on day one, and the XO, Maggot McGee's, go to bed. You folks have to get up at 5 a.m. for your strike. How do you go to bed when you're going to war, you don't know how it's gonna turn out, you know there's gonna be hostilities and casualties, and your squadron mates are launching in harm's way. So I remember trying to go to sleep, maybe got an hour of sleep, and I remember about 4 a.m. the plane's landing and I slept right under the arresting gear. So on that, as we're in that ready room about five in the morning, there's no Scott Spiker. So we go up to Skipper, I'm like, Skipper, you were on that strike, where's Spike? He's like, well, uh, he may have had to divert into one of the uh, Saudi air bases. He may have had an aircraft malfunction. We're like, okay, well, you know, Everything good? Yeah, they shot at us. We got our harm off and maggots like, let's go. We have to go get our brief, start briefing, get ready. We had a TOT in the early afternoon. So, so what wasn't relayed to us until after we returned from our mission, which I'll get into shortly, is as they're flying towards Baghdad, remember, nobody flew downtown Baghdad in the war except for the F-117s. So they're probably with our, our aircraft probably within 30, 40 miles. And as you go into a seed mission, they reach carrying three high-speed anti-radio missiles, missiles. They spread out like fingers, and they spread out about 20 miles on their own racetrack. And so they separate the four ship, each flying in, each getting ready to launch their harms at about a minute to a minute and a half intervals. And as they're doing that, the MiG-25 is prosecuting them. Now, the Hornets are probably at 25,000, maybe 30. The MiG-25's at 50, it's doing 1.8 Mach, and Spock, the leader, our skipper, locks up the MiG-25. He is able to identify it via NCTR, which is no longer classified as a MiG-25. However, he can't shoot due to rules of engagement because it's not 100%. He's asking the AWACS for confirmation. And by the time the chatter, people stepping on each other, the MiG-25 is out of his weapons range and it's flying south to, towards where Spike was about 30 miles away. And seconds later, the skipper sees a fireball in that direction. He tries to raise Spike on a radio, he cannot raise Spike. They continue with their mission, they egress. They're not sure if Spike was shot down, they think so. They're not sure if he survived, they have no way of knowing, and they're back on the carrier, of course. We had the first casualty of war, and if you remember, uh, Vice President Cheney at the time gets on the news back in America, says, well, we have our first casualty of the war, and it was Scott Spiker. And they had no confirmation he was in fact dead. Uh, he could have been alive, could have been egress, and you don't know. But didn't know anything about that. Now we're on day one. I'm with our strike package, and we go up to the carrier intel center to receive the massive strike package. And remember, we were pretty good at this point. We had been operating in theater for six months. I was still a nugget, but I had six months of flight experience of tanking, right? Of, of extending the pro, plugging in the drove, taking fuel in day and night in bad weather conditions. So I was more seasoned, but still a nugget. So as a nugget, I was part of the day one strike package to 8th Street Airfield Complex in Southwest Iraq. 
Now this airfield complex, if you know the ge uh, geography, is sort of a buffer between Iraq and Israel off to the west. They're not friends. And this was a British fortified area, right? The Brit Britons dominated the Mideast uh, for a very long time. Now the Iraqis had it, multiple airfields, full ear order of battle, including MiG-21s, MiG-23s, MiG-25s, MiG-29s, F-1s, SCUDs, dozens of different tank brigades and operations down in that area. So basically, if you get shot down, you probably were not going to get get out safely, right? Probably be captured if not killed. And our strike package, which consisted of about 35 airplanes or so, was to go into the H-3. We're going to take out the, the POL, petroleum oil lubrication facility, take out the aircraft uh, sector, uh, the hangar, and the sector operations center, which was the big center that controlled all those military operations here. And I was part of the strikers going in to 30,000 feet. We were each carrying four 2,000-pound bombs, Mark 84s. We had two Sparrows, which are a semi-active uh, radar-guided missile, and then we had two Sidewinders for self-defense. And we were going in in our four ship in the middle. Leading us out in front, about 40 miles away, were four Tomcats doing a MiG sweep to push any bad guys away. Up to the northwest of this strike, we had aircraft that were launching Walleye, which are a TV guided bomb. That was our precision back in the day. And this is a 30 mile range glide bomb. To the west, we had Hornets launching tall, tactical air launch decoys. These come off the airplane and fly a profile like a aircraft. They stimulate the IADs, integrated air defense systems. Hopefully, they shoot the SAMs, surface to air missiles, at those drones, right? Not at us going in. We also had two axes of EA-6Bs jamming from the southwest and southeast, and they were also launching harm at intervals of about 30 seconds. Harms will come over the top and open up their seeker about 30 second intervals, and if they see any of the surface-to-air missile emitters, they will target them home in and destroy those launch sites. All right? The idea is to create a sanctuary or window of about two minutes so we can get in, drop our bombs, and leave without being targeted. So we probably had about eight to 10 harm coming down. We did not expect to see enemy aircraft on that mission because we had the Tomcats. And actually earlier in the day, you had Eagles pushing any bad guys out of that airspace. As we are driving in country in a, our strike group, about 35 of us, and we would launch from the aircraft carrier, we'd rendezvous on our KC-135 Air Force tankers. They would circle near the carrier, stacked 1,000 feet, one nautical mile nose to tail. About five to six aircraft would go on to each tanker. Once all of our aircraft were aboard, the strike lead would say, tanker lead, we're here. They would start driving across Saudi Arabia, which is a massive country. It's twice the size of Texas. It would take us an hour to get to the other side of Saudi Arabia. At that point, all the planes are, are topping off their fuel. We'd get to our end point about an hour, hour and a half later, the tankers would orbit. Then we would start pushing off in that predetermined strike package. So it's 35-ish aircraft would start pressing in. It's important to note simultaneously, the Kennedy aircraft were launching a concurrent strike in H-2. That was 60 miles away. So we had about 70 US Navy aircraft in that Southwest Iraq during this day one strike. And as we're driving in country, we're listening to the strike common frequency. There are airborne four or five bandit groups. You can hear them talking about those bandit groups. Those are bad guys flying. There are a couple of bogey groups. Those are unknowns. They're not sure if they're friendly or good. And you're trying to plot in your mind all these aircraft flying, all the communication, people being shot at, and it just became very, very difficult to follow. I was a new guy. I was flying off a of maggot. Maggot was one. I was two. Chuck Monster Osborne was number three of the flight, and Mark Fox was a spare. He was number four. At some point, we started blocking out all those external distractions. We had protection from the harm. We had protection from the Tomcats. Let's focus on getting to the target alive, in formation, enter our 45 degree dive from about 28 or 30,000 feet, get our bombs off on target, dumb bombs, but you still can get them fairly close within 100 feet, and get out above 15,000 feet to stay above all of the AAA, all of the handheld SAMs and some of the mid-range SAM sites, and then egress safely back. 
As we are flying in, we're about 35 miles south of the target, sort of in a wallish type formation. There are calls made about bad guys approaching. And at that point, we had already selected our air-to-ground mode of our F-18. In the F-18, in all modern fighters, there are different modes the radar operates. By hitting a simple button, it stops scanning airspace, and it'll now focus on air-to-ground modes and mapping modes. When you're in those air-to-ground modes, back then especially, you will not be able to detect airborne aircraft prosecuting you. You need to be in that ear-to-ear -ear mode that way for so we are now looking ear to ground, mapping our target from about 30, 35 miles away when, and no essay that there were a couple of MiGs approaching us, the E-2, Charlie from Saratoga alert us, said, hey, 400, smag it side number, you have bad guys on your nose at 15 miles. I remember sitting there, going, that can't be right. 400 bandits on your nose, 15? How did that happen? But we weren't paying attention. Within a couple seconds, we all reach down and hit our ear to ear mode and our radars come up. And simultaneously, radar starts scanning. Maggot was the first to get a lock. He is calling out that he had radar contact in their nose, mocked at 28,000 feet. And what there were, were two MiG-21s at 28,000 feet flying 1.2 Mach directly towards us. We were four F-18s at 30,000 feet flying a .9 Mach. We're closing at about 12, 1300 miles an hour. I heard the declaration from the E-2 that bandits on your nose at 15. That would allow me to shoot beyond visual range. But for some reason, Maggot called them bogeys and he called for a visual identification of VID. So now I'm confused. We have bad guys coming towards us because the E-2 told us, but my lead is going for a visual identification. In combat, you, the worst thing you could ever do to shoot down a friendly and I'm waiting I'm trying to process what is going on the clock is ticking at some point those aircraft can be within minimum range I want to comply with rules of engagement I want to comply with doing the right thing for my lead but I couldn't take it anymore as I'm approaching minimum range of the missile I get an electronic identification in my cockpit that they are MiG-21s it wasn't part of rules of engagement but it helped me make a decision Coupled with the declaration call that they were bandits at 2.5 nautical miles, I took a shot, I pressed the trigger for the AIM-7 Mike Sparrow, and initially nothing happened. And I'm like, why is it not coming off? But I'd never shot a missile. It was about a second of the launch to eject. Within that one second, to clunk off the right side, 500 pound missiles flying out in front of me, as the MIG is approaching and I see a speck and the missile is pulling to the right. I'm like, why is the missile going right? The MIG's in front. Well, the missile's smart. It's projecting where that MIG is going to be within the next five or 10 seconds. It impacts the MIG, a MIG ship, a black, a brown and tan MIG, 0.5 nautical miles for me, which is for us folks, that's like across the street when you can see it. 0.5 is extremely close. The MIG immediately starts to nose down as pieces are breaking off and the black smoke is trailing. And I call, when I take the shot, Fox 1, MiG-21 low. Seven seconds later at impact, Splash 1. I had no idea on the other side of the formation, Mark Fox took a A9 mic shot and then a 7 mic shot on the other MiG. Matt, right, and he took out the lead MiG. Maggot the lead, who wasn't sure they were good or bad, is going for visual identification. He takes a MiG down one side, fireball that Mark shot, and then MiG down the other side, fireball that I shot. And now we're 30 miles from the target with two pieces of, two wreckage going down towards the, the deck. And we had a quick learning turn. We didn't go back to ear to ground mode. We stayed in their ear to ear mode. So we are pressing on towards the target now and out come more aircraft prosecuting us. We lock in, they're about 20 miles away they're a little bit slower at 0 .6, 0 0.7. We're not sure if they're good or bad. You can't shoot. We asked the E-2 to help us identify them. The E-2 did not reply. There's so much radio chatter. So we're driving in. I drive into within four nautical miles of this target that is now flanking me, turning slightly to the north. And we're thinking it might be a SAM trap. These bad guys are trying to pull us in 
to the SAM. So the SAMs, remember, there were tons of SA-6s, sky guard system there, trying to pull us lower so they can engage and shoot us. And also, remember, we're carrying 8,000 pounds of bombs. We're not that maneuverable. We'd have to jettison. Our mission was to take out the target. We look down, we are over the target. The MiGs are now, or the, what we think are MiGs, are turning to the north, running away. At that point, we drop them. We hit ear to ground. I am rolling in. I hit ear to ground at that point. The plane comes over. All of us are rolling over. We're in our 45 degree dives. We get our ordnance off, and Maggot and I were on the sector operations center. We had great hits. We come off target. I immediately go ear to ear, seeing if the MiGs are turned around. They did not. And then we turn to the south and egress bait safely back towards the tanker. We got on the tanker, uneventful. Of course, I'm missing a missile. Mark Fox is missing some, and we had two kills, and we didn't lose anyone. On that mission, I didn't know this, but Maggot felt with the ear, the surface-to-air threat that we might lose 50% of our strikers going over the target. So two or three of us might have been shot down. There were six SA-6 batteries there. There's AAA of every caliber, and AAA, can, some of it can get up to 30,000 feet. Handheld SAMs, etc. I'm happy that our jamming and the harm were able to suppress the enemy air defenses and that we were able to aggress safely back towards friendly lines. We got back aboard. It was a hero's welcome. First kill since Vietnam War. Did not expect it to happen. The Hornet had proved itself in combat, right? There were many folks that weren't sure if the smaller fighter, strike fighter, would be successful. With modern avionics and the ability to switch from air to air, air to ground, it, it's interesting. We did not have a chance to sort and really know there were two aircraft there. It happened so fast, but just the ability to get a call at 15 miles closing that fast, to raise the radar, lock in and get a weapon off from time of alert to time of fireball is 45 seconds. 45 seconds, very hard to do in some of your earlier generation uh, aircraft. So I was fortunate to survive the war we had several other aircraft that we lost throughout. I mean, night two, we lost uh, four A6s went into that same target area. One was shot down. One was shot up so bad it limped back to Saudi, never flew again. Two made it back, shot up. A few days later, we lost a Tomcat, which is a great story of Devin Jones and Rat Slade that if you ever get them on, uh, flew 25 combat missions throughout Iraq, I flew combat missions into the Kuwait theater of operation, etc., and was able to survive and gain experience, bring those experiences back, and then returned several times over the next 15 years, Operation Southern Watch, and then OIF. I found myself back there again in 06, now leading a Super Hornet squadron, flying with orders, now with precision weapons, things that we didn't have back in the first Gulf War, now with second, third generation of flare, forward looking infrared precision guided weapons and they're able to go ahead and uh, protect our troops on the ground. All right, well that'll do it for this episode. Look forward to talking to you guys again soon.